welcome. Our theme for tonight um, will involve some mental exercise, uh, even more than last week. Sorry, I should, probably shouldn't tell you that, but you'll find out right away. <laughs> But, so this, so I'm going to go through an, an article of, an argument of St. Thomas for God's existence that is one of the most difficult, but one of the most beautiful arguments and most far-reaching in its consequences. Yeah. Okay, and this is, what we're going to do is called the fourth way to show God's existence. Because um, last week we went through the um, first three ways, rather, uh, the last, the third way went very quickly, but um, so this is called the fourth way because it's the fourth one that St. Thomas lists. And in all of these proofs for God's existence, we start with something evident that everybody is aware of in everyday experience, right? So we start with common experience of the world, and then we use the principle of causality. Um, and from those two things, the, our common experience of the world and the principle of causality, we get to God. Right? Last week, we took our starting point, um, movement and change in the world. Today, we're going to take our starting point, something more sophisticated, but equally evident. We look out in the world, and we see that there are things that um, have more or less perfection. In other words, we, look, we go to the zoo, and we see in the zoo that the animals aren't all of one kind, but they're um, um, varied, and they're varied such that some are higher than others. Some have more perfections than others. Um, and we see this everywhere in nature, and we see it in human society. We see it... Um, and it's a universal principle that God has made the world... Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. That the world we, that we experience um, has this gradation of um, order from lower to higher. And so that's our starting point. Now, I'm going to read the, artic, the argument the way St. Thomas puts it, and then we'll go through it and explain it. So he says, quote, The fourth way is taken from the gradation to be found in things. That's lower or higher. Among beings, there's some more or some less good, true, noble, and the like. But more and less are said of different things insofar as they resemble something maximum. As something is said to be hotter, as it more nearly resembles that which is hottest. And so there's something that is truest, something best, something noblest, and something that is utmost being, maximum being. And those things that are greater in truth are greater in being. Now, the maximum in any, um, in any class of things is the cause of everything in that class. As fire, which is the maximum heat, is the cause of other hot things, like a hot metal or a hot room or something like that. Therefore, there must be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, um, of their goodness and of every per other perfection, and this we call God. All right, so what is he saying? So, roll up our sleeves here. Okay, so he's starting, we said, with the observation that there are grades of perfection. There's things that are better than other things, um, higher than other things, more noble than other things, more beautiful than other things. And whenever we find things that are more or less, there's got to be some... Um, maxim. There's got to be some um, something that is that by nature. And he's, what what Saint Thomas is doing here is he's saying there's um, there are things that participate that share in something more or less. And when something shares in something more or less, it has to be caused ultimately by that which um, doesn't share but is that fully. Um, let's take a simple um, example of that. Um, or actually, maybe before I get to the example, let's, um, let's first focus a little more on these 
so we see grades of things and the grades of things so um, grades of goodness for example there's moral goodness the goodness of say sacrificial love and that's a higher good than other kinds of goodness like a physical goodness a sound body health um, which is um, higher than say the goodness of a mountain or a rock Right? But even the rock has its own proper goodness to be marble or granite, etc. And, and so each thing has its own goodness, but the goodness of things isn't equal. There are things that have a far higher goodness than other things, right? such as the goodness of um, self-giving love. Right? And again, so if we find things some higher than some lower, there's got it, they're all participating more or less in goodness. And so the idea is this. Is it going to be the less that gives rise to the greater? Or is it the greater that causes the less? Now, in each individual, the less becomes the greater, right? When we grow up, we start out less, the baby. And so in every individual, we go from less to greater. But that only can happen if there's another who... um, is already uh, already has it who communicates it right in other words you can't give what you don't have right this is the f- a fundamental principle of um, of common sense and of how we get to god right? you can't give what you don't have and therefore it's got to ultimately be the more that which is greater in goodness that causes that which is less Right? And that, that which is more beautiful that causes the less, etc. Yeah. And so we see there are things that have in part and other things that... Um, let, let's take a thing. So St. Thomas uses this example of heat. Yeah. So let's, let's use that example. Um, we used to have a wood-burning stove in our house when we lived in Argentina. And... Um, that provides a good example for this. If, if you have a wood-burning stove in the house, you come into a house like that, and the rooms will be hotter or colder depending how close they are to the room that has the furnace, the wood-burning furnace. Um, and so the air in the outer room participates a little bit in the heat. But then you get into a closer room, participates more. You get into the room with the furnace, the air is participating more in the heat of the furnace. And then you get up to the furnace, supposed to be made out of metal, and you touch it, mistake, and you get burnt. And because the metal is participating still more of the heat. Um, and all those things are participating, the air in the outer room, the air in the closer room, the metal of the furnace. But none of them are hot by nature, right? Air's not hot by nature. It can be hot or cold depending whether it participates the heat from something else. Metal can be hot or cold, depending whether it participates the heat from something else. But then you open up the furnace, and you stick your hand in, don't do that, and, um, and you get burnt, because the fire is hot from itself. Why? Because of the nature of fire to be hot. Fire is by nature hot. And that which is by nature hot causes the heat in the metal, in the air, etc., and so we see that what is something by nature causes that which participates more or less. Let's take another example. Um, holiness. So we see that um, in the church there are saints of more or less, or they're faithful, of more or less holiness. Um, and again, when we see more or less, what should we think? There's some maximum which is the cause of the more and the less. All right, so what's the maximum holiness that's the cause of the more or the less? Well, that's easy. The maximum is Jesus Christ, right? The, the word made flesh. And he's the cause of the holiness of the members of his mystical body. Right? Because he, he gives a share of his grace to the saints according to our mission and cooperation with the grace that we've already received. And so we can grow more or less um, towards that maximum uh, according to how we correspond to God's grace. But we'll never 
clearly, right, there'll never be a saint that's holier than the source. Right? Because every saint participates um, that which uh, Jesus Christ has in full. Right? And so again, where you find more or less, there's got to be a source. And the more or less are participating, participating means having in part, having more or less, and they're sharing in something that one has fully and isn't sharing, but simply is. All right. Um, other examples might not work quite as well, but I'll try. Um, well, let's, let's say you hear music. This is the same as the furnace. So you, you um, there's a concert being played in the hall. And so you come into the, the building where the concert is, you open it, and that, you hear the music faintly, you get closer, and you hear it more strongly, etc. It's the same idea that um, the air is participating more or less in the, in the sound. Right? Until you get right up to the strings of the violin that are um, causing that sound. Right? And so the air is participating, but the, the strings are... Uh, uh, maybe that's not a perfect example. Um, or n- another example would be, suppose you have a beautiful landscape, Swiss Alps, and you have a bunch of landscape painters. And all those landscape painters have their easels out there and they're all painting this landscape. And we can see that the paintings um, are participating in some of the beauty of that landscape. Uh, and some more, some less, according to the skill of the painter. But it would be silly to think that the paintings are more beautiful than the landscape that they're paying, right? They're sharing in that beauty. Although sometimes artists do think that, right? <laughs> I, used to, I used to be an artist. But <laughs> I used to make statues of my wife, but it would be very foolish to think that my statue was more beautiful than the model. Um, right? So again, it's the same thing, that the, the statue participates more or less of the beauty of the model. But the beauty of the model is the source of the beauty of the statues. Um, I don't know, Beethoven Symphony, played by different orchestras. And some orchestra plays more perfectly, with a better conductor, etc., others less perfectly, but they're all striving to reproduce something that was um, what Beethoven intended in his mind. Right? That's the would be the maximum there. Right? What the composer intended it to be. And each orchestra or conductor will get more or less. And the same thing with the play. Right, so we see um, the different grades are, are participating. There's got to be a maximum that's the model or cause of the others. Now, if that's true of these different examples, let's apply that idea now to being. So we look out in, in the world And we see that being has many grades. There's the being of the the granite, the being of the ants, the being of the warthog, the being of the the, the eagle, the being of the human being. And so these different levels of being. And they're higher, lower, more. In other words, we can say that a human being, and this may sound strange at first, has more being than the granite. Because, the, I mean, we both have some kind of being in common. We're both bodies. But the granite is just a body. But we're a living body. We're a sentient body. We're a rational body. And all of that is a level of being that the rock doesn't have. Right? And so we have more being than the rock. Far more. Right? We've got rational being, we've got free being, we've got moral being. And the rock doesn't have any of that. And so we have a higher level of being. We're participating in more perfections of being than the granite does. Right? We're having being in bigger part than the granite. And in between us and the granite, there are those things that have more and more as so far as they approach and the level that we have in the physical world. Right? And in the physical world, we have the most. Because right? we're the only ones who have that rational, free, moral being. 
spiritual being. But we're still participating. Right? We have some grades of being. But we're not being. Right? We're still participating. We, what do we say? We say just simply the grammar of everyday speech shows this. We say, I have being. Right? I have. But we don't say, I am being. Who says that, by the way? God says that. But we haven't yet shown that he exists. But, uh, but the very fact that we say, I have being, shows us that we're not the source. I mean, we come into being. We get it from somewhere. We, our bodies at least, go out of being. And we lose it. And so we're participating in being. And we've got a, a good participation in being, a higher participation than other things. But again, where there's more and less, there's got to be a, a source, one who is it by nature, by essence. All right, so we can put down this principle. Those things that share in a limited way in being, in goodness, in truth and beauty, are caused, have to be caused ultimately by something that is it essentially, is it by nature, is it by essence. Thus, what do we conclude? There must be something that is goodness, by essence, that is truth, that is beauty, that is being, by essence, that's the cause of all that which has it more or less, all that which shares in it, all that which participates in it, according to more or less. Mm -hmm. So in choosing beauty, aesthetic beauty, or another type, it's incidental what it is In essence, because it's not it, it's not the creator of the type, mm -hmm. so it could be genius or um, intelligence or right. It's got to be ultimately or, intelligence, right? That's the cause of but, but order. In, in terms of gradation, mm -hmm. the the, uh, the individual trait itself is is incidental, but you're choosing good as, as the one to explain. The uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the. Wait, wait till the end, okay. and 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 write it out if I haven't satisfied you. But keep it, keep your thought. So we're what we're saying is that where we've got the more or less, all those things that share more or share less, there's got to be something that doesn't share. That is it by essence. That's the source of this sharing more or less. Whether it's goodness whether it's um, holiness, whether it's being. And the reason for this is simply the principle of causality. Again, you can't give what you don't have. Nothing can be the source, the sufficient source, the sole source of something else greater than itself. You can be the source of something less than yourself, but not something greater. Yeah. Right? No one can produce in another what he doesn't have already in himself. Right? Just as the, the artist can't make a greater sculpture, right? Michelangelo can't make a greater sculpture than he already has in his mind. He's got to first have it in himself before he can make it in another. Right? The source has got to be greater than that which participates in it. Right? No one, and teachers know this. You can't, if you don't have it clear in your mind, there's no way that your students are going to get it clear in their minds from your lecture. Right? You have to first understand it and then you hope that you'll be able to give a participation of that to others. To understand that, you have to define being because you can use mathematics to say you can always add a number to another to keep going on a, on a line. 
<laughs> okay, right, so an obje- so there's an objection. An objection would be, there is no maximum, because we see in quantity there's no maximum. Is that the objection? Yeah, it's maximum versus uh-huh. infinity. Right, so in quantity, you can always add another number. There's no maximum number that's the cause of all numbers. That's true. Um, but um, that's because in mathematics, there's not actually a cause at all. In other words, when we, in, when we do mathematics, we're abstracting just one part of being. And, and thus the whole idea of an efficient cause doesn't enter into it at all. And so that's why that's not, um, that's a misleading analogy. It's true that in mathematical things you can always add more and you never get to a maximum. But it doesn't follow from that, that in being, it's true that in participated being you can always add more and you'll never get to a maximum in participated being. But there's got to be a maximum different in kind, not just a bigger number, but something different in kind altogether that's the source of those that participate. The problem with the mathematical analogy is each one is the same in kind. Just 100, 100, 100, 100. But there's, what we're saying here is that all those things that participate in being, in other words, that are limited, that are creaturely in the sense of being limited, all those things that are finite have got to be ultimately caused by something that is infinite, not finite. In other words, because the finite is precisely that which participates, has it in part. And so that which participates has to be ultimately caused by that which doesn't participate. So it's not just a bigger number, it's a different, um, it's not that which has being, but that which is being is going to be the cause of that which has been. How should we put this? Um, Let's go back to our heat example. You go into the house and the room has heat. Well, that heat doesn't explain itself, right? It's got a cause. And it's got a cause in something that's hotter than it. Stove. And the stove... The heat of the stove doesn't explain itself either. It's got a cause in something that's hotter than it, the fire. But the fire does explain itself because the nature of fire to be hot. Now, obviously, there can be things that are hotter still, but they're different kinds of fire. And they're all hot through themselves. And we can do the same thing for us now. We don't explain ourselves either. Right? We have a certain degree of goodness, but just like that room that's warm it's it's warm because the participating is something else's warmth our being doesn't explain itself either we've got a certain degree of being but that being is participating and therefore there's got to be another that is its source and that other will be unlimited in other words the unlimited is at, is the foundation of everything limited We're used to thinking it the other way around, I think. And I think Darwinism has a big impact on our imaginations. We tend to think that the amoeba is what gives rise to the human being. And and so we've got this image in our imagination of the less giving rise to the more, just kind of by nature. But that's not actually... uh, That actually goes against all of our everyday experience. Right? All of our everyday experience were these examples I gave you before, where you have to have more in order to, to give a share of that to someone else. Yeah. Let's take a, a, an image of this using cups. Yeah. All right, so this is any kind of visual image is going to be defective. So I'm, I'm forewarning you this is a defective analogy. Yeah. When we look out into the world and we see these different levels of goodness, we could compare them to different containers containing more or less being. And some things like, say, the, the human being with more being, rational being, moral being, spiritual being, the, um, the zebra with the sentient being, beautiful being, and the granite, or the, say, the tree, and then the granite, even less. And, and, but each one is participating. Each one is got a certain limit and is being filled from some source that we can't see, right? So this is, we look out in the world, this is what we see. These various containers, all having being in more or less. 
So what do we conclude from this? Each one is receiving. There's got to be a giver. Right? They can't just be receivers. And the giver, what must the giver be? Not like these. In other words, you can't, the maximum isn't just going to be a bigger cup. Again, that was the problem with the number analogy. Right? You're trying to find the highest number. Well, that's the same kind of thing. The only thing that explains all these filled cups is something that's not a filled cup. This is the same thing we did last week when we were talking about the moved mover and the, we said that there can be chains of moved movers and you can have as many moved movers as I, but what has there got to be? There's got to be another mover different in kind, an unmoved mover, an uncaused cause. So we're saying the same thing here in a different way. All of these different containers have got to ultimately be caused by being that's not contained. Being that the unlimited, the limited has, can only be explained by the unlimited, which I can't draw for you. <laughs> and this is the problem, right? What if I can't draw it, and you can't imagine it. And of course, I can't imagine it either. And so our tendency is, well, what I can't imagine doesn't exist. Yeah. But the very thing we're looking for here is precisely something that Yes, we can't imagine because it transcends this the creaturely. It transcends the finite. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Right? In other words, what we're saying is it's impossible that there be an infinite chain. All right, this one receives it from this one, which receives it from this one, which receives it from this one, and then we, I draw bigger and bigger cups um, forever. Right? That's impossible. There's got to be a first source that's not uh, a limited amount of being, but is being unlimited. Uh, so to use an example, uh, an ocean of being. But the problem is, even the ocean of being is still limited. Uh, and so our first source, this unlimited being, is that which doesn't have being, but is being. <coughs> or if we want to speak about goodness, our first source of goodness is going to be not that which has goodness, but which is goodness. Our first source, because each thing has a truth, right? Each created thing has a truth. The truth about human beings, the truth about frogs, and there are levels of truth, just like there are levels of being. So what has there got to be? There's got to be a first truth. Again, that's the cause of all the participations. In. So we've got truth, goodness. There's got to be a first of all of these. But there doesn't have to be a first number. Yeah. Because, <laughs> and why is that? Um, because this only works for things that are um, perfections that don't have any limitation in them. Number, by its very nature, is an imperfection because it only applies to material things. Only material things have number. And likewise, there's no first red that's the source of all red. Why? Because red implies limitation. Only material things are red. So, so that's why it doesn't work on everything, right? Again, back to that objection about the numbers. There's no first number, right? No first red, no first big. That's the cause of every more or less big thing. But there's got to be a first being and a first goodness and a first truth. That's the cause of all beauty, good, and truth. Because there's no lim um, goodness doesn't have any intrinsic limitation in it. So what we're saying here is that the things that participate more or less being that very idea of participate means receive. 
if I, re- if I participate more or less being, it means I've received being in a certain degree. And it's impossible that everything be a receiver. That would be an inexplicable world. It would be an uncaused world. It would be contrary to the principle of causality. There's got to be a first thing that doesn't receive, but is. In other words, doesn't participate, but is it. And so, and that thing which doesn't participate but isn't, what do we call? Everyone calls. Yeah. Now, no doubt this argument is arduous because it forces one to think in a way that we're not accustomed to thinking. To trans- in other words, it forces us to transcend everything we can imagine. That's the difficulty. It forces us to think um, about being, uh, and we, we, we don't. That causes usually brain freeze. Um, I remember teaching this once in a class, and um, one of the students, I um, started to see that their eyes were red, and I go a little further in the fourth way. I get up to about this point, and they're red and glistening. And then the little jewels started coming down the cheek. And uh, they were crying because they, they couldn't get the fourth way. Um, um, so if you're having trouble, you're not the only one. <laughs> but the beauty of this argument is it shows us something much greater about God than simply that he's the uncaused cause. It shows us that he is being. And that's exactly what God said to Moses when Moses asked God for his name. When when God commissioned Moses to go to speak to Pharaoh, Moses made an objection. They're not going to believe me. Who should I tell them sent me? He's asking for God's secret name. And God says, I am. Tell them I am sent you. And in the Bible, names aren't just um, conventional. No, Biblical names tell us who something is or what something is. A biblical name tells the meaning or inner identity, essence of something or someone. So when God says that his name is I am, he's saying that his essence, what is his essence? To be, to be simply, in other words, to, to be without any limitation. We can't say that. We have to say, I am a human being. I can't just, we can't say, um, tell them I am uh, sent you. Because we're not everything. Right? Um, I hope, yes, that's right. <laughs> but God is Everything, not everything. He's precisely the fullness of being without any limitation. So yes, God is not red, because to be red is a limitation. But he's the fullness of all being without any limitation of being. Right? And that's what this... In other words, it's such a beautiful thing how this very difficult metaphysical argument coincides with what God told Moses 14 centuries before Christ long before metaphysics was dreamt of by Plato and Aristotle. Right? A thousand years before the, the first um, Greek metaphysicians. God gave to Moses, and Moses wrote down, the most incredible metaphysical, um, the height of what reason can know about God. That God, that we have being and God is being. How astonishing, if, if you didn't believe in biblical inspiration, and Revelation, how astonishing that that would be present in um, Exodus. Um, in a much more perfect way than it's present in Plato and Aristotle. Yeah. And in fact, there's a whole, I'm sorry, there's a little parentheses. Um, a great um, scholar of Christian philosophy, Gilson, um, 
um, he loved this because um, his idea was that Christian philosophy got to the heights that it did in St. Thomas Aquinas because St. Thomas Aquinas had an advantage that Aristotle didn't have. He had Exodus chapter 3. In other words, he had God's revelation to Moses. And so St. Thomas could come up with this fourth way. Why? Because he was probably helped by having read Exodus uh, numerous times and having prayed about it. And so St. Thomas, let's read the, I've given you the text here, Exodus 3, 13 to 15. Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God says, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am sent me to you. He is and we receive being. He is being. And and that's why that name is the most proper name given to God in the Old Testament. All the other names of God in the Old Testament have to do with God's relation to creatures. That God is the Lord, that God is the King, that God um, is the Creator. But this name, I am, He who is, that is God's um, being in Himself. Simply the fullness of being. So all the other names come to him from his relation to us. But that name is properly his. There is a name that's still better, but that had to wait for the New Testament, the Blessed Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the most intimate name of God. But that's beyond the reach of philosophy. Whereas this name is the uttermost reach of philosophy. I am. And it also follows from this that God is one. Because if God is this maximum being, well, it's pretty clear that there can only be one of them. There can't be different gods. Uh, some have, because if there were different ones, one would have more or less, they would be participating in being. And one would have more or less, and neither one would be God. Right? So there can only be one that is... And so again, we see the perfect harmony... Of, of what God revealed to Israel 1400 years before Christ Hear O Israel the Lord your God is one right? and all the other nations um, in polytheism and again the harmony the magnificent harmony between the revelation to Israel and what reason much later could come to know about God right? that he's one and that he is and it follows from this also that God is the creator of everything absolutely everything and that nothing can be that because nothing can be that's not participating in being but what we've just shown is everything that participates more or less that means absolutely everything that is whether it is in a small way or is in a big way everything that there is whether it's matter, whether it's form whether it's angels, whether it's um, toads whether it's galaxies is participating in being and has to therefore come from he who is being so it immediately follows from this also that God is the creator of absolutely everything And that too wasn't known by anyone outside of Israel. Again, what a beautiful thing that what God revealed to Israel 1400 BC um, that we find in the books of Moses is again what even Aristotle and Plato couldn't formulate. But which philosophically aided by God's revelation in someone like St. Thomas Aquinas can, yes, come to, to know and demonstrate right, so again the harmony of faith and reason and this is a we were talking a few weeks ago about motives of credibility for the for God's revelation that it's truly God who revealed this well this is a motive of credibility 
the harmony between what God revealed to a rude and uncultured people um, escaping from Egypt in 1400 BC or whenever um, and how that matches the very best that the greatest minds in all of human history could come up with about God. And this should give us confidence then when God reveals other things that reason can't get to, such as that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we believe him. All right, so God is the the creator of everything that participates in being. The source. And we find this in, um, um, in some way in the book of Wisdom, chapter 13. Um, the book of Wisdom, we, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? When we were looking at the um, starting the proofs of God's existence. The book of Wisdom says that those people who didn't know that there's a God um, are foolish because they ought to have been able to know. And his argument is from the greatness of and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator as being more, as being the source. In other words, if, if they knew that these created things were beautiful, how come they didn't know their source is beauty with a capital B? If they knew that these created things were good, how come they didn't get to their source, goodness itself? That means that every, everything that we find in the world, in our experience, that is noble, right, that's just the participation of, of what God is infinitely. And this also tells us a lot about God. If we find something very noble in our human experience, say, uh, personhood, well, that tells us that God is that more. Infinitely, he's infinitely, he's so much person, he's so personal that he's um, three personal. <laughs> sorry, but I mean, that, I'm only half sorry. Um, in other words, if we see perfection such as um, being a person, well, God is certainly not going to be an impersonal God, which tragically is how so many who even do get to God think of him. Is that maybe he's the laws of nature or the, the force or um, uh, something like that. But that would make his creature better than him. If his creature is a person, then he's not. Or take the, the beauty of um, communion. If we find this great thing, communion, the communion of persons formed by self-giving love, well, that shows us that God has to be that more, infinitely. Again, the Trinity. If we have some knowledge, well, God's got to be it. He's got to um, have all truth, etc. Okay. All right, let's. I'm going to really press my luck now and pass on to another argument. I shouldn't do this, but um, there'll be questions all right, at, the, at the end, so keep your... Now, this fifth way is a lot easier. And this fifth way is, the, I think, the ordinary way that people got to, un, to know that there's a God. And it's the argument from order in the world. And this is much more intuitive, although, again, I think Darwinism has had a huge negative impact on um, making it harder for us to see this argument. But it's not um, really affected by Darwinism. It just takes away our imagination, I think. Um, so this fifth way comes from order. So we look out in the world, and one of the things that we see is that um, we see an order in which things without intelligence, without rationality, um, act in such a way that is consistent, right? They act consistently and they act for an end. They don't know the end because they don't have intelligence, but they go to a definite end and not just anywhere. Because we look out in the world, what we don't find is chaos. 
Not everybody has to agree to that. No one would, and the first person who has to agree to that is every scientist. Because no one would ever do science if they thought that everything was a chaos. Right? The scientist is looking for natural law. And looking for natural law means looking for things that act always or almost always in a consistent way. For some kind of end. Not an end that the thing knows, but for some kind of end that's the object of their movement or their activity. And so whether it's in the world, the animal kingdom, um, think of the instincts of the animals. So that bird that flies 4,000 miles south to a very specific thing. Right? That's acting for an end. But it's clearly not an end that the bird's going to be able to explain to you. <laughs> so it's acting for an end that it doesn't know and didn't invent. Right? And the same, whatever it is, the spider making the web, um, any, any kind of animal instinct shows you that that animal acts consistently for an end that's marvelous that the animal doesn't know, at least in the abstract. Yeah. And the same thing happens in the plant world, right? The plants do these incredible things for an end that obviously nobody thinks the plant knows. Right? And, but it's not even only, right? I mean, again, the oak tree, whatever it is. But it's not only, you could go to, um, you know, the one-celled creature and he's got these, um, um, how do they move? They've got these kind of flagellum that m moves them like an outboard motor, and it, it's moving so that it's for an end. Clearly, that flagellum isn't there for nothing. It's there to move the um, amoeba or whatever it is um, where it needs to go. And then you go into the, the structure of the cell and you find unbelievable things that are for an end. It's got a waste elimination system and it's got passports. So certain things can pass cell membranes because they, they've got their uh, code and other things they can't. Um, and, and you see all of this clearly for an end but not an end that the amoeba knows anything about. Um, and then you look out even in the inanimate world and the same thing happens. You see in the inanimate world, things act for an end and that end is just simply gravity, take gravity. Things go to the center of the gravitational field according to a constant um, formula that we can formulate as a physical law, which has a particular, um, there's a particular constant that determines the degree of attraction and it's just that way and it's not some other way and we might wonder why is it that it goes to an end precisely in this way and not some other way but it, it happens everywhere in nature it's for an end and then we could even further look at these different laws of nature and notice wow all of these laws of nature which have these very specific laws governing inanimate bodies and it looks when you start to think about it that they're perfectly formulated such that we can be sitting here tonight. Why do I say that? Because if this law of gravity, uh, this is what scientists, I mean, obviously this is not my uh, knowledge here, I'm um, encroaching on another field. Um, scientists tell us that if this, um, the law of gravity, which has this certain constant of attraction, if that were, ch and it's you know, got a whole bunch of these decimal points, and if you were to change it ever so slightly, make it greater, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight because there never would have been the Big Bang. Everything would have remained in a crunch. And if you make it ever so slightly less, we wouldn't be sitting here either because everything would have been dispersed and there wouldn't be galaxies and we wouldn't be sitting here. And you can do the same thing apparently according to the natural scientists, according to physicists, with, a whole, with 30 different laws of nature. Each one shows the same kind of um, exact fine-tuning. This is called the fine-tuning argument. Um, that it looks like these laws of nature, again, were very well designed um, for an end. So, it, whether you buy that, or, that last bit or not, doesn't, the argument doesn't depend on it. The argument simply depends on wherever we look in nature, we find things acting according to laws that the thing doesn't know about and which is marvelous. That's enough for our purposes. Right? All things without intelligence act consistently for ends that they don't know and don't plan. All right, so what does that show us? It's impossible, right, for things that don't know an end to consistently act for a marvelous end um, unless there's an intelligence that ordered them to that end. In other words, it's simply, what this argument is based on is that order itself requires a cause ordering 
And the proper cause of an ordering is an orderer. And an orderer, ordering is the work of intelligence. And therefore, an orderer must be intelligent. So we see all of this marvelous order in nature by things they can't order themselves. And what does that tell us? They were ordered by one who does have intelligence. Whether it's um, gravity, whether it's the strong or weak nuclear force, whether it's the bird flying 4,000 miles south, whether it's our heart beating, even if we're not thinking about it. um, All of these are examples of an ordering that requires intelligence ultimately, but which the, um, the creature didn't do. And so, who did? That's the argument. So the way St. Thomas puts it, he says, we see things which lack intelligence, this is on page six, such as natural bodies that act for an end. Right? Simply the rock falling to the center of the gravity, gravitational field would be an example. And this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way. And so as to obtain the best result. Or we could simply say so as to obtain a marvelous result, whether it's the best or not. And hence it's plain that they achieve their end not by chance. I I don't think anyone would say that. Even the Darwinist. He wouldn't say it happened simply by chance. He would say that it's the inevitable outcome of um, certain conditions that impelled it to that outcome. And therefore, again, some kind of law. And if some kind of law, some kind of... Well, he doesn't go that far. Now, whatever lacks intelligence, St. Thomas goes on, can't move towards an end unless it is moved, directed, by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence. And he gives this marvelous example of an arrow. So if you get an arrow that hits a bullseye, and what do you think? It didn't just go there by chance, right? You... When the arrow hits the bullseye, you think it was shot by a good archer. Because clearly, it will never hit the bullseye just by chance. And so when we look out in nature and we see bullseye after bullseye after bullseye, what should we think? There's some mighty good archer. And even Darwinists have to recognize this. No, because, all right, Darwinists say, fuck just simply having natural selection and the survival of the fittest. But when they start to look at every, wow, every step of the way, that, I mean, if that happened faster than it ought to have happened. In other words, it's, even atheist um, um, molecular, or, uh, molecular biologists are amazed at the... Um, in order to get from the lower to the higher, you have to have this marvelous coming together of all kinds of things, and it, it happens each step of the way. I mean, we just take, and the problem is our imagination has gotten deadened because we've learned to take it for granted. Yeah. But Darwin himself, in his book, uses the example of an eye, and so he says, "I I know that you know one of the big problems for my theory is that there seem to be certain things that only work." if everything is perfectly ordered and don't work at all if one of their parts is not. And therefore, I recognize that um, things like the eye are um, a, a, the kind of the test of, of a theory such as Darwinism that would do away with the ordering intelligence. Yeah. But... Um, Uh, what should we say about this? Um, something like the eye. The marvel of it is that it's... I mean, we don't even know how... Uh, you can only talk that way if it's like a black box to you, if you don't know what's happening inside. But once you start to... This is the thing. The more we know about science, the more we come to know how marvelous these systems are and how magnificently ordered, how far more incredibly ordered they are than we thought before we knew anything about it, when we just took it for granted the more we ought to be amazed at the work of an orderer that's arranged 
immense number of things to come together such that it works perfectly only if all those things have come together at the same time and in the same way. And there's a whole mathematical side to this, um, which I don't want to uh, get into, but let me just... Um, when you have a whole bunch of things that have to come together for a thing to work, it's an exponential um, improbability. Right? So if you have a hundred things that have to all come together for the eye to see, and probably, the, do you think they're just a hundred? No, they're probably far, far more than that. But supposing there are a hundred things that come together for the eye to see, and if you say, well, maybe it just happened by chance, not by design, not by an intelligence. That's not one in a hundred. What is it? One in ten to the hundredth. That's a hundred zeros. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, that's, that's unlikely. <laughs> All right. So, again, we look out in the world, we see order. What should we think? An orderer. And if the orderer can't be the creature, because he's not intelligent, and yet he has this marvelous order, there must be a first orderer that's the cause of all the order that we see. Right, that's the argument. And everyone calls that order God. Let's take some examples of this. If we, um, we, we look at next door at the cathedral, right? And if somebody were to suppose, well, that order, I don't know, maybe it didn't require an intelligence. Maybe it just came about. Um, no one would ever think that, right? No one would think that because we know in the things that we make, we know how complex they are and we know um, the kind of intelligence that the architect has to make them, right? Think of all the pieces of stone and glass to make up the mosaics, the 40 million or whatever they are in the basilica here. Um, so nobody ever would ever, ever dream that that happened by chance. And yet, why do we do that about, say, the human being, right? Which is more marvelous in order, it's having our minds dulled, I think. Um, and not just the human being. What about the simplest one-celled creature? Right? Immensely, incredibly more marvelous than the Cathedral Basilica. Because it's alive. And it reproduces itself. And it's got this language of its own reproduction written into it. Yeah. Right? So no one would ever think that simply wind could make the Cathedral Basilica. Suppose we're... Now we're looking for life on and, and these... Outer, outer space. Suppose we would go to Mars and not find the... All right, if we found the Cathedral Basilica, what would we think? Right? There's intelligent life. And we'd be absolutely right. Right? I mean... But even if we found a, um, a ditch dug in this shape of a star, right, what would we think? There's intelligent life. Because you're not going to get a star um, except by some kind of intelligence. Even though that's a very simple kind of order. Or, or simply um, some geometrical pattern. Right? We'd think there's an intelligence. And yet we look at an amoeba and we don't think there's an intelligence. But what if we did find a second uh -huh. intelligent life? Uh -huh. What would we think? We'd think that there was a God who made it. Well, but would it undermine this argument? Why, why would it undermine the argument? That it happened again a second time. Well, no, because what our argument is, is that well, this, this everywhere we look, we find this marvelous order. So if we sought life in some other planet, what would we be seeing? Some marvelous order. And therefore, it would simply be more evidence for an orderer. Now, I don't think we probably will find that. But that's for a different reason. That simply has to do with the fact that God's an artist. And an artist makes a plan in which everything's unified. But obviously, God has his reasons. And so my argument is not a strong one. Yeah. There was a, um, a movie at which I should see because I use it all the time as an example. Contact. Uh, did anybody see that? Um, so they're looking for out, um, life, intelligent life, and with the idea that radio signals perhaps could give us, if we found a, a series of radio signals that showed an order, right, that would lead us to think that there was an intelligence trying to communicate with us. Now, this doesn't really happen. It's just a film. But in the film, they come across a series that is, I think, the prime numbers from 1 to 101. And they think, an intelligence must have sent these because that can't be by chance. There's too much order in the prime numbers from 1 to 101. 
All right. What is more orderly? The prime numbers from 1 to 101? What's a more marvelous order? That or the amoeba? Or simply the laws of nature? Right? Simply the law of gravity. Yeah. And so if we would immediately assume an intelligence is the cause of those prime numbers, how are we blind to the, the cause of the order? That's everywhere. So much more incredible than that. St. Thomas, um, in his, he has a commentary on Aristotle's physics. And he, in that, um, I think both Aristotle and St. Thomas speak of, but it's, um, speak of nature as a kind of art. They make this analogy between nature and art. But nature is um, a m- far more marvelous art than any human art. Um, a craftsman, to make a boat, a shoe, sculpture, um, he has to prepare the materials, cut them and so forth and fasten them. Um, but what does God do in nature? What does the orderer do in nature? He, things are such that they move themselves to m- get to their end. That's the incredible thing about nature. Is that, in other words, nature is immensely more incredible than the order of an artwork. Because in the order of the artwork, the artist had to move all the things to get them the place where you wanted them to be. But in nature, the things are such that they move themselves to their end according to an inner principle. That is an order that really um, shows the, uh, the intelligence of the orderer. I'd imagine if you could uh, make statues make themselves. Yeah. When, I mean, of course, again, the problem is our imagination gets deadened. We see the tree sprout in the spring and we don't think anything of it. Yeah. The leaves, no, whatever. Well, now the, the, the programmers will program a computer that once you set the button, set it going, it does all kinds of things and will keep, keep doing them all by themselves. Is that the yeah, that, that's a, a marvelous kind of product, no? And that's why we admire it so much because it's approaching a little bit, but a very little bit. To nature, obviously, nature is immensely more because um, there's a real self movement in the natural thing that's not really there in the computer. The co- but um, the computer isn't really one thing; it's part moving, part moving, part moving, part. But the uh, the living thing is has this unity in its self movement. But in any case, um, it's that example works well enough. But even the atheist, Mike um, Darwinian. Um, biologists who think that we don't need an intelligence to be the cause of the marvelous variety, whenever they describe the the cell, they always use terms that come from human um, um, technology. So they talk about the cell as a kind of incredible factory. But what is that? The very analogy is so telling, right? Because it tells us the cell has an order that's like a factory. Well, a factory, everybody knows, had to have a designer. So if we can't speak about the cell except using these analogies of um, the factory, the truck, the passport, the elimination system, the, um, the nutrition system. In other words, the very language that we speak about natural things is the language of an analogy with an intelligent order. Isn't the attraction of scientific knowledge that it leads to further understanding of technology and it affects how we live, but it's not clear what if uh, a knowledge or a designer doesn't automatically lead to understanding that affects how we live or what may happen is that it leads to an understanding which people haven't liked and therefore reject. I mean, some of the some of the medieval patterns of life, people found people today find objectionable, and therefore they reject. Let's the take this for question and answer, all right? And let me just close it off here. The sorry, um, 
the idea here is that um, the more we look into the created world, right, the more we see law. Right? That's the, the fundamental principle. And again, people, I think, have the idea that modern science disproves the need to believe in God. But when you think about this, it's exactly, it ought to be the exact opposite. Because the more we investigate the natural world, what do we find? Simply more incredible, marvelous law becomes disclosed to us. And so once again, the beautiful harmony between reason and revelation. In other words, the very um, lawfulness of the created world is what most um, inaudibly, though, points to the lawgiver. And we can use this same argument with regard to a more incredible law than any we find outside of us. We can apply the same reasoning to the law that we find inside of us, not in our body, but in our spirit. In other words, the law of conscience. When we find in ourselves a law that we clearly didn't write to love our neighbor as ourselves... And we know that that law binds us. But we're not the author of it because sometimes we would like to change it or limit it. But we know that we can't because it continues to reprove us. That law too points to a source. Right? Where there's a law, there must be a lawgiver. If we're not the lawgiver of the moral law, there must be one who is the lawgiver of the moral law. And everyone call him God. Right? And so this is another variant, we could say, of the same argument. Where we find order, there's an orderer. Where we find law, there's a lawgiver. And so all the different levels of law, not just the laws of nature, but the natural law written on the human heart points to a lawgiver. And in this case, a holy lawgiver. Right? Because we recognize that law as holy. And the source of whatever holiness we have here in human society. And therefore the source of that law is the holy one. And on that note, let's end and um, have questions and answers after.